Uh, I want to thank Colette for that introduction. And uh, I want to thank Colette and Robin Olgren for inviting me to this. And where's Joe Asferino, if I'm pronouncing that right? Yeah, and thank you for the amazing Palouse Tables project. I love reading it and learning more about what you're all up to. I'm very, very impressed, to say the least. I also went to the Moscow Food Co-op this morning and ate well, and that's impressive as well. <laughs> really nice. Uh, also, I want to thank Amanda Snyder, uh, who kindly put these slides together, showing the book covers from the last two projects that I have done with immigrant and refugee youth. And they are both um, garden and food related projects. And I'll be reading some poems, and you'll see some pictures of the poets from that project. It's called The Stories of Arrival, Refugee and Immigrant Youth Voices Poetry Project. So it's all about what we're about today, which is how do stories and poetry take us back to our ancestry, our history, and help us shape the future by telling those stories of what happened so that we can vision and imagine what can still happen. So I'm very honored to be here. And again, I can't thank Colette and Robin enough for this honor. And I'm happy to be here because among my many passions, and I would say obsessions, I am an obsessive gardener and an obsessive cook, uh, is that I get to pay homage to storytelling. The stories we tell, our personal stories, along with our regional stories, our national stories, as you all know, they determine the, with vision and imagination what kind of future we can shape. How can we, at this point in our history, right now, shape something that's more equitable and more sustainable, which is so much what you're doing here with this amazing food summit. So when we tap into the huge repository of cultural myths, legends, folk tales, we're instructed. And on a symbolic level, in many ways, what the old stories tell us is how to cherish the natural world and how to cherish each other. The wisdom embedded in these old tales is too often neglected and forgotten and along with losing that wisdom, we stand to lose our deep affection for the connections we have to each other, and by extension, to the connections we have to our landscape and to our place. In the oldest tales and in poems, imagination brings the natural world to life. It's true in poems as well, so think about it. If you know these stories, in how many stories do stones speak? Does the wind give you some advice? Do brother and sister moon have a voice? Do stars murmur? Do lion and mouse have something to say? We need the leap of faith that stories ask of us. We need the play. We need the agility of imagination. It gives us back both our sense of wonder and stories also give us a sense of possibility, what can still be. And that sense of wonder and that belief in possibility, I know you agree with me, are two things really needed in today's world. We can almost touch the unseen spaces of connection between ourselves and others when we become swept up in the stories of somebody else's triumphs and also their struggles. Images haunt us. They stay with us way more than statistics that can overwhelm us, that do overwhelm us. It's the same with poetry. We honor our experiences, no matter our losses, our sorrows, our regrets, when we find metaphors and images that reflect who we are. In our different family and cultural cuisines, as you know, we delight in creative blends sweet and sour, spicy and soothing, colors and textures with memorable flavors. And it's like that with our stories. They live within the storehouses of what's deeply personal in us, but they also live in the history of our place, of our landscape, of our collective memories. 
And if you think about it, storytelling is really a big deal. It does give witness to our collective humanity. That's why I titled this talk, Stories Are Us. Everyone here knows that words matter. Within the myths and folk tales of tribal people, indigenous peoples, traditional cultures, our stories are mirrored. And think about that again. When you hear a story of unanticipated sorrow, of loss, of empathy that's bestowed on someone from someone else, of inner strength that a character in a story discovers, or a story about a whole community solving a difficult problem with robust courage. Listening to each other, listening to these stories, we grow in our mutual compassion and it increases our regard, not only for our similarities, but very much so for our differences. And here's something I love about stories. In old stories, traditional stories, they level the playing field. There is no blame in a story on a character for his or her status or situation. It just is. In so many tales, and think about this. Go back and think about stories from your childhood, or right now. In so many tales, it's the smallest animals who have the greatest courage. And they often bring about dramatic changes for the good. And just as often, it's characters lacking in wealth, lacking in power, who because of their generosity, their cleverness, their kindness, they're rewarded in triumph over the mighty. For most of us, isn't this always satisfying? Who doesn't want hope? Who doesn't want to hope that good overcomes evil, that kindness and generosity trump greed and selfishness? When things go askew, stories instruct us. They teach us in their roundabout and imaginative way that coming upon a problem or a difficulty is the very thing that becomes an opportunity for discovering new ideas and creative solutions, which, as you know, is at the heart of resilience and regeneration, and which helps bring about positive change. So I want to give you a little example about this from a story, a long ago story. Long ago, you see, there was a man, storytellers don't need glasses, there was a man who was very, very poor. This man was so poor that often his children went to bed hungry. No matter how hard he worked as a shoemaker, as a cobbler, he never had quite enough money to bring adequate food into his house. He wept at night when his children went to bed hungry. One day, the cobbler was walking near a bakery and that smell of fresh bread drew him closer. He looked at the cooling loaves and thought to himself, if I could just steal one loaf of bread for my hungry children, the baker won't notice. He won't even miss it. And as soon as I have money in my pocket, I'll pay him. So the cobbler snatched the loaf of bread. The baker saw him, thief, he cried out, thief. And the sultan soldiers came at once and led the poor cobbler to prison. What was he to do? What would his wife think when he didn't come home at the usual time? And the children, he knew that the punishment for theft, no matter how small, was severe. He could be in prison a long time. Just as he was thinking what to do, something hit him in the face. A horse's hooves had kicked up some dirt and mud, and with it, the skin and kernels from a pomegranate. The cobbler wiped his face off. He looked at his hand. He looked at a pomegranate kernel. Suddenly, he had an idea. He began muttering under his breath just loud enough so the soldiers who were leading him to prison could hear him. Oh, if only the sultan knew my secret. If the sultan knew my secret, he would be so impressed. He would reward these soldiers greatly for bringing me to him to tell him my secret. The soldiers heard the cobbler. They said to themselves, hmm, great reward from the sultan. Let's try it. 
If the man has a secret, we get the reward. If not, he goes to prison. So they brought the cobbler to the sultan. The sultan was a curious man. And uh, what is this secret? The cobbler spoke. Oh, great sultan, in my hand I have a pomegranate kernel. It was given to me by my grandmothers and grandfathers and father and mother. If it is planted in the morning, by the next morning, it will grow a pomegranate tree full of luscious, ripe pomegranates. I have hit hard times and was saving it for my son, but I offer it to you. The sultan liked mysteries. He said, oh, this must be a magic seed. We shall see. Tonight you spend in prison. Tomorrow morning you will plant it in the royal garden. If the next morning there is a pomegranate tree, you will go free to prison tonight. The cobbler smiled slightly and spent the eve night in prison the next morning. The cobbler was brought to the royal garden. The gardener had already dug a small hole to plant the tree. The sultan arrived with his guards and advisors. All right, you may plant the seed. The cobbler bent over to plant the pomegranate seed, but he stood up. Oh, great sultan, I, I forgot what my mothers and father and grandparents have told me. No one who's ever taken or stolen anything can plant the tree. I, I cannot have this honor, for I stole the loaf of bread for my hungry children. The cobbler turned to the advisor. You, the sultan's chief advisor, you are an honest man. Please have the honor. But the chief advisor waved away the sultan's hand. He spoke softly. I cannot plant the seed. You see, many years ago, I was given good advice for the sultan. I gave that advice, but claimed it as my own. And I took from that man the chance for a promotion in the royal court and a great reward. I cannot plant the seed. The cobbler turned to the royal treasurer. You, treasurer, you are an honest man in charge of all the great wealth and fortunes of the sultan. But the treasurer bowed his head and whispered, I cannot plant the seed. Not long ago, the sultan gave me many, many sums to give a great treasure to a deserving great person. But I did deliver the treasure, but kept some for myself and told no one, I cannot plant the seed. The cobbler turned to the sultan. You, sultan, you are the most honest man in all the kingdom. Please take the honor. But the sultan spoke softly. I cannot. Some time ago, I took a medal with precious jewels in it from one of my soldiers. I cannot plant this pomegranate seed. The cobbler said, you men, you have achieved such wealth and status and power. I am just a poor cobbler who only stole a loaf of bread from my hungry children. I, I know stealing is wrong, but the sultan burst out laughing. Oh, you are a clever man, and you have taught us an important lesson we will never forget. I will pardon you, I will pay the baker, and you will go home in my carriage. This afternoon, the treasure will bring you a great reward, every bit of it, so go with my gratitude. The cobbler rode home in the sultan's carriage, and that afternoon, the treasurer brought him a huge bag of gold, every bit of it, and a fine basket of ripe red pomegranates. <laughs>I'm going to switch from that story to a little bit about my own work. Uh, I have the privilege in my own work, as Colette said, of listening to immigrant and refugee stories. And these are stories, like all of our stories, filled with the beloved traditions of gathering at the table with extended family. And they're also stories of missing the farms, the gardens, the food that define a specific place. When we are forced to leave home, 
or experience the utterly painful separation from family members for whatever set of complex circumstances, physical dislocation can become an intense emotional dislocation and our sense of self is dramatically set adrift. We also experience dislocation if we are marginalized within a locale or region as the result of stigma and fear of difference. And don't we all feel dislocated from long-standing root causes of poverty, from hunger, from climate change, from encroaching development and depletion of natural resources, blessings of feeling in place, enfolded in familiar sense and taste and rhythms become a thing of the past. Yet, wherever we journey, whatever unseen or seen borders we cross, we carry our stories with us. Our most recent project called Holding the Earth Together, Youth Voices Speak for Our World, brought out strongly heartfelt poems that show deep connections to food and to place, no matter the distance. A young poet in that project named Ling Yung, age 15, a refugee in Burma, endured a life-threatening journey to escape war. She reached into a deep and questioning place, all about her shifting identity as a newcomer to a new land. And I would like you, I would like to read her poem to you. It's called, Am I Still Who I Am? Ling Yung, age 15. Am I still who I am? From a village called Chang, a daughter of my village, who grew up beautifully with her village taking care of her. My village is my mother and father who I love. The farm that grew there is in the heart of my village and it will never be mine again, gone forever. I came from a needy village to a wealthy country. Yet the heart of my village who raised me like a mother is still in my soul. People will change like a season. Yet, the mothering spirit of my village is a part of me. And the moment I fail to remember my village is the day I lose my memories. Will they be gone forever? As stars join the sky every night, will new memories come into my heart? Am I still who I am? Ling also wrote a joyful poem about rice which, as you might know, is to Burma what wheat is to the Palouse. Here's Ling's poem about rice, my mother's white rice. It was winter, hot water boiling. I heard the shush inside the hot pot as my mom poured the rice into it. The rice started to dance up and down. I heard the sound, luck, luck, luck. When I looked into the pot, the water was gone forever. The rice had gone to sleep. When I took one spoonful and closed my eyes as I ate, I could feel the flavors of my mom's love. And the previous year in our food-themed project called Our Table of Memories, Poetry and Food of Spirit, Homeland, and Tradition, uh, which is dedicated to the possibility of a world, let us hope, where no child is hungry, Ebenezer Leon, another refugee from Burma, wrote in part, rice. When I eat rice, I picture my family coming home from work and from school. Rice brings our family together. Every time I devour rice, I recall back to Burma. Rice, you are the only thing that can bring our family together. If you did not live with us, my world would be nothing. Ah, rice, I don't want to just sit down at the table. I don't want to just eat you and be content. I want to walk into your fields where the water is shining. I want to stand there with you far from the white tablecloth. I want to fill my hands with the mud of your fields like a blessing. Ling and Ebenezer show us in their poems about rice how the imagination allows something as basic 
and beloved as rice to spring to life. Their poems speak to deeply held memories and the ways in which most of us associate food with family, with a sense of belonging, of safety, and home, no matter how far away we find ourselves. Poetry has a way of connecting us through our senses, fragrance, texture, sound, image, imagination. This afternoon, when you tell your own stories, food-related stories, I invite you, call on your imagination as you delve into your own story, your memories of food, family, ancestry, inclusion, Savor those connections that you discover and share with each other. I'm really looking forward to that part of this afternoon. Poems and stories celebrate our food traditions, but they also reveal what it feels like we're when we are deprived of eating or growing the food that is part of our identity. Everyone here knows that hunger, both hidden and painfully obvious, is alarmingly prevalent throughout our local communities, our nation, and our world. When writing about hunger, Kum Thuan Hen, also from Burma, puts it in simple, stark terms. His poem is one of many pieces from our tables of memories that express the anguish of hunger. No food, by Kum. I picture my gray village in Calais, Burma the gray of soil and grass. I breathe deep and deep. I smell sadness, the crying, the shouting for help because of no food. No food, and without food, we are not given peace. The scarcity of food basic to our survival and well-being extends to storytelling because stories are the connective matrix of a community. How we weave our cultures and our agriculture together is a story in the making. Stories of landscapes that flourish, of community gardens and thriving local food systems and farmers markets remind us and bind us to ideals and practices of what community can look like. And stories from time-honored cultural traditions remind us of our place in the larger story of Earth and cosmos. They remind us we still can lean in close and listen as we tell our stories and learn to see each other in our distinct, and I would add, beautiful humanity. Storytelling and poetry are the language we have from which we can take word and image, heart and mind, and weave intimate connections between ourselves and others, between our landscapes, and between the animal and natural world. Stories are us, all of us. So I want to thank you again, in closing, for the honor of speaking to a group who I know has worked with amazing care, cherishing this land, this place, with diligence, designing a wheel that contains all of the ingredients necessary for growing and sustaining a flourishing food system, and furthering a community based on belonging and inclusion. For any traditional storyteller, a circle always is representative of the wheel of life and the go-round of the seasons. The circle, the circle stands for the encompassing equality we could have with no one above anyone else and all voices respected within the circle. Past, present, and future are bound up within the circles of our stories. We dream the world we want 
before we can create it, before we can work together to make the changes we hope for. We dream of a common table where no one is a stranger. As you know, with collaborations and partnerships, we find many ways of co-creating more sustainable, resilient, regenerative, and thriving communities. And of course, this includes community gardens, which give us beauty, sustenance, biodiversity, and a spirit of belonging. In short, a garden, like love, no matter how big or small, is meant to be shared. So I'm going to end with a story about a community garden. And I chose this story because I wanted very much to honor the legacy fruit trees of the Palouse. I'm so eager to learn more about that. And this is a tale for real. I mean, it's a tale, but it's also about the honoring the very first apple trees, which are said to have come from Kazakhstan. And I think to tell the story, I'm going to move. And storytellers don't wear glasses. <clears throat> so this story is from Kazakhstan. And it is about two men. Over here was Asan, and he was a farmer. And over here was Hassan, and he was a shepherd. They were neighbors, and they were also very, very close friends. But one winter, it was so cold, so severe, that the ground was completely frozen, and Hassan's sheep could not get to the grass beneath the ice. And the entire flock perished, holding back tears. Hassan went to Asan to say goodbye. Asan, I, I cannot survive. My whole flock is gone. I, I can't survive. I, I must leave. I've come to say goodbye. But Asan wouldn't hear of it. No, I impossible. I, I won't accept that. You, you become a farmer. Stay here and, uh, and take half of my farm, please. Asan, you are too kind. Y your farm is, is small. I if you divide it in half, there won't be enough. But Asan said to Hassan, it's true, my farm is small, but we will have enough. I won't take no for an answer. You must stay. Hassan embraced his friend Asan, and the shepherd became a farmer. Days passed. Nights passed. Weeks passed. Years passed, and one day, Hassan was digging in his part of the farm, and his hoe struck something hard. He leaned over and heaved it out of the ground. It was a pot. He looked inside, full of gold coins. He called Hassan, Hassan, come quickly, you are rich. Hassan, Hassan looked into the part pot and said to Hassan, no, 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 you found it on your land. You are rich. No, it's your land. It's your treasure. You take it. You take it. No, you take it. You. It was the first time these two friends had ever argued about anything. And so they decided to take their problem to the wise man. They found the wise man sitting in his yurt surrounded by four students. They bowed low and told him their problem. The wise men listened. Hassan and Hassan waited and waited and waited. And finally, the wise men spoke, but not to Hassan or Hassan. He turned to the first of the four students. Oh, this is an interesting problem. What would you do? The student answered immediately. Well, neither man wants it. They found it in the ground. I would just bury it in the ground again. The wise man shook his head, turned to the second student. And you, what would you do? Well, neither man wants it. You should keep it. Indeed, the wise man's face darkened. 
He turned to the third student. And you? Well, everything in the kingdom belongs to the Khan. And the gold was found on the land. The land belongs to the Khan. The gold should be given to the Khan. The wise man shook his head and frowned again. And then he turned to the fourth student, the youngest among them, a boy named Arman. And you, said the wise man. The boy shook his head as if he was chasing away a daydream. And then he said, if it was up to me about what to do with the gold, I would buy seeds and plant a garden all on the steps, a garden for everyone with fruit and flowers and butterflies and insects where everyone could come and enjoy it. The wise man listened to Armand's vision with his eyes closed. He put his hand on the boy's arm. Very wise, Armand. He looked at Hassan and Asan. What do you think? The two men nodded and smiled. Yes, a garden. So the wise man instructed his student how to journey to the capital city to buy seeds for the garden. It took Armand days to walk the dusty roads. When he arrived in the capital city, what color, what hubbub, what noise, merchants on every side calling out their wares. The den of hundreds of languages made Armand's head buzz. Pungent spices and incense tickled his nose and prickled his eyes. But finally, the boy bumped and stumbled his way through the crowds and came to the cellar of seeds. Just as Armand was fingering the precious kernels, a loud, pitiful cry made him spin around. And there, passing through the square, was a caravan of camels. Every camel was loaded with birds, hundreds of birds, and, and they were alive, but their feet were tied up and their wings encrusted with dust. Armand couldn't bear it. Without even thinking, he confronted the caravan leader. What are you doing with those birds? Ho, ho, said the leader. These birds, oh, I have birds here that were caught in the deserts, the mountains, the steppes. I have birds that were trapped in lakes and rivers and marshes. I have birds that are the rarest in the kingdom. <laughs> Some of these are the last of their kind. Armand could not bear the arrogance and pride in that man's voice. And he said, I I'll give you the gold. I'll give you gold if you give me the birds so I can free them. The caravan leader smirked and began to lead the caravan away. But Armand ran after him. No, no, look, he said. The, caravan's eyes, leaders lit, the caravan leader's eyes lit up with greed. It was more gold than the Khan would give him. He snatched the gold before Armand could change his mind. Armand knew that those birds were headed for the Khan and his sons to feast on meat and decorate the palace with feathers. He was deeply glad to spend all day untying each bird. His heart grew lighter as each one flew free. Finally, holding the last starling that was still too weak to fly, massaging it carefully until finally it gained its strength and flew away, Armand stood up, dusted off his clothes, and began to journey home. At first he stepped lightly, but as he reached the village, his steps grew heavier and heavier. And he thought, what have I done? What have I done? The gold wasn't mine to give away. What will I tell my teacher? And those two men, they trusted me with the gold. And he said out loud, now there will be no garden and he slumped to the ground and wept. A starling cocked its head and flew away. Suddenly, what was that noise? What was that? Armand looked up. 
The air was filled with brilliant feathers and rushing wings. Armand was astonished as bird after bird glided down toward him. He watched as the entire steppe was busy with birds scratching the earth, pecking at the land, preparing the ground for planting. Falcons arrived from distant lands, their beaks full of exotic seeds. And using wing and beak and claw, the birds planted the seeds. With powerful talons, eagles arrived and dug holes for ponds. Pelicans came and filled them. For a long time, Armand sat entranced. When finally he stood up, the birds rushed into the air as one. But wait, what was this? What was this? The seeds were sprouting. Before he could blink, stalks turned into trees and blossomed. Before he could think, the blossoms fell and there grew round yellow apples, bright and shiny as gold coins. Armand stared to make sure he wasn't dreaming. He plucked one of the apples and ran back to the wise man's yurt. The wise man ran out and embraced Armand. Armand, he said, bright eyed and breathless. Armand poured out his adventures and then gave out the golden apple to the wise man. The wise man crunched the apple, its sweet juice filled his mouth, and he knew that the gold coins had been transformed. Armand happily led Asan and Hassan and the wise man to the garden. Soon the people came, Hassan and Asan looked at each other and grinned. People young and old rested and played. The fresh fruit and clean water nourished their bodies. The soft lawns and cool shade rested their minds. And the sound of hundreds of birds singing made their spirits soar. Such is the story of a garden, a magic garden, that came about because of the generosity of two old friends and the dream of one young boy. May we all dream our gardens that they flourish and sustain us. Thank you so very much. Thank you.